Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and it reads, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all by Shem Hamashiach Yahushai, giving thanks to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, by him. All praises to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, by Shem Hamashiach Yahushai. First thing I want to say is there is joy in the Israelite's life. We always have to remember that. There's joy being an Israelite. There is joy being an Israelite. No one else can even imagine what that joy is like. But many people don't know that Israelites must suffer. We got to suffer. That's part of the script. The, the existence of Israelites is to do good and to suffer. That's what this whole book is about. There's more verses about suffering in the Bible than Satan himself. There's more Versus on suffering, then talking about uh, the other nations. Let's look at uh, the book of John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16. John 16, and let's read verse 33. John 16, 33, these things I have spoken, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what the most high, this is what Yahweh is saying. He says, be of good cheer. You still could overcome the world. This stage was set up for the Israelites. All this stuff is happening because of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's the only reason. You got to remember, the word has been going out for quite some time. And when the word goes up into the spiritual realm, it affects the physical realm. It speeds up things. When we received the truth, everything started speeding up. More things started happening on the earth because the 12 tribes are getting sealed. So Satan knows that his time is short, pursuant to Revelation chapter 12. Let's go there. He knows his time is short. Watching CNN, those guys are just as big a, big a liars as Donald Trump. You got Cuomo's brother, who's a reporter. He's at home saying he got the COVID-19, but he's on TV every day. I thought he was sick. He's quarantining himself. It's been over 14 days. Why are you still at home? I think he's been lying from jump just to get ratings. But you can't believe these bumbling heads. Revelation chapter uh, 12, verse 15. And it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. The woman is us. That he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The flood is the lies. And the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Right? So the truth swallowed up the lies. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of the Most High and have the testimony of Hamashiach Yahushai. We have that now. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you just had... The commandment keepers, they didn't have Yahweh Shai in, the, in their doctrine. It was just the Old Testament. We didn't really start keeping the commandments as Israelites, as people here in America, the Negroes and Native American Indians and Latinos. We didn't really start doing this until the 80s, 90s on up. Preaching the Gospels with the commandments and the testimony of Yahweh Shai. So it's speeding everything up. The church has never taught the commandments. That wasn't affecting the hemisphere or the atmosphere. But now it's being affected. So now Satan is mad and he's coming to make war with the remnant of her seed. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, and let's look at verse 3. Verse 2. 7 and 2. 
And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living power. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom was given to hurt the earth and the sea. All right, these angels are the most highest chariots. This is what a lot of brothers and sisters have been reporting, seeing in the skies. Things have been changing because of these angels. They're protecting. You notice we're being affected, but nothing else on the earth is being affected. The animals are not being affected. The uh, produce is not being affected. The vegetables, none of that stuff is being affected. The earth is not hurt. It's just the people. Look at verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our power in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So he's speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jump to verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. All right, so this is talking about us being scattered all over the earth. This thing is affecting the whole earth. All the places we've been scattered are being affected, and it's being televised. India, Africa, uh, Japan, China, America, South America, North America, North Europe. We've been scattered to all these places. All right, and we all speak different tongues. We all cleave to different nations that we think that we're a part of. Okay, that's what it's speaking of here. And cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our power which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Let's go to Hosea 1 and 10 in the Old Testament. Our people don't know who they are. And for years, the pastors have been telling them to repent, and they don't even know what to repent from and how to start keeping the commandments. No one's telling them how to keep the commandments. I remember when I used to go to a Christian church, and um, I grew up in this church, and I have no animosity towards none of the people there, but other than not knowing the truth. And I remember they were like, come up to the altar and be saved. And so people would trot down there and get saved. People had fear going down there to, to give their life to the Most High. You know, they were petrified to walk before all these other people and go down there. I remember this vividly. And, you know, just walking, just to walk down there put fear in you because you didn't want nobody to see you. <laughs> I'm just telling you to play. So you go down there, and then you think that everything is going to change, and then they put anointing oil on you, and then they take you in the back. I mean, this is what happens in every Baptist church, God of Christ church across the nation, across the world. Then they take the group of people that decide to give their lives to the Most High into a little room, and then they give you a little pamphlet. And they said, these are the ways of God. And basically, they want you to join a church, and they don't have anything in the pamphlet concerning commandments. They don't teach you about the 613 laws. They don't tell you who Christ is coming back for, which is the nation of Israel. That we just read, if y'all hadn't forgot who are listening, we just read that he's going to seal 144,000, right, from the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's read Hosea 1 and 10. Hosea 1, 1 and 10. It says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. Does it say Christians? It says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. Like we just read in Revelation 13 and 9, uh, 11, I mean 7 and 9. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, because when we got here, they said that we wasn't the children of the Most High, that we wasn't the Israelites, that we was just niggas and spits, blacks and and, and uh, Haitians, you know? They had every nickname under the book for us. 
And those of you who are not of these people who are listening, you need to be educated to learn what the Most High is coming for. He's coming for his people because here you said that they were not the Most High's people. That's what it, that's what it means here. Ye are not my people. There, where's the there? All the places where we've been scattered, there it shall be said unto them, ye or you are the sons of the living power. See that? You are the sons of the living power that was scattered. Where I said that you weren't my people because you were in strange doctrines. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, which is Hamashiach Yahweh and they shall come up out of the land. For great shall be the day of Israel. See that? For great shall be the day of our salvation. Let me go one more. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Most is going to come free us from this land, but we have to go take part in the sufferings. Luke chapter 1, verse 69. We're going to appoint a leader. Here it is. And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, who came out of David. You read Matthew chapter 1 on down. It says that Christ came out of the loins of King David. Verse 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Ever since the world began, they warned us about these days, Ezra's and Nehemiah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah. They warned us about these days, 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Why? Because they didn't tell us that we were not God's people. It wasn't on the pamphlets that we weren't God's people. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. We couldn't perform the mercies. We couldn't perform keeping the commandments because we didn't know who we were. We were supposed to perform it. We were supposed to rehearse the righteous acts, keeping the feast days and so forth. To perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Who's the holy covenant with? The 12 tribes of Israel. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham, he was our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. Because what are we all in right now? All of us are in fear of this nation. We are in fear of them destroying us. That's why we have to get sealed with the Heavenly Father's anointing in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. All right. Yahusha is coming back to redeem the children of Israel. Let's go to Matthew 15 and 24. This is serious, man. Matthew 15 and 24. But he answered and said, who's the he? This is Christ, Yahusha. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who he came for. He said, I, I wasn't sent for nobody else but the house of Israel. So we have to understand when we read Revelation chapter 13 that he is coming for his people and we have to participate in the sufferings. Let's go to... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's read verse 12. And it reads, Yea, and all that will live godly in Hamashiach Yahushai shall suffer persecution. You see that? We are going to suffer persecution. It's coming. Get ready. Satan, the dragon, is coming to make war with the remnant of the seed of the woman. The remnant are those who keep his commandments and follow Hamashiach Yahushua. Get ready. We're going to suffer and will feel pain 
disappointment, disparity in this life. We're going to experience trials. Okay? To other people, it may be meaningless, but we're going to experience trials just to receive the salvation of the Most High, just to see the mansions that he has stored up for us. Let's go to Galatians. Book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. No, let's go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, and it reads, Be not deceived. The Most High is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What you sow, you shall reap. When he says, when he says that he is saying you will not escape, best believe whatever you sow, you will not escape the reaping. If you smoke and you are young, just wait, you'll reap it. You're going to reap it in your flesh. You know, you may stop when you repent, come to the most high, but it ain't going to leave your lungs. You're going to have to deal with that. You know, if you sow oranges, you're going to get oranges. You sow bananas or peanuts, you're going to get bananas or peanuts. If you sow sex with various people, trust me, you're going to reap it in your flesh with some disease or something. You're going to reap it. That's just the laws of, of the Most High. The same thing with drugs, porn, lies, cheating, all going to catch up. You know, repent, change your ways. Most people who come into the truth, they repent. You know, they heart, re, re, they heart may rejoice because of they just repented to change their ways, but all the things that they've done in their life, even though they're trying to forget the past, it will come back up. You know what I mean? This is just the reaping of the sower. There's uh, family members in Israel of the scriptures that also suffer. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Let's read verse 12. And it reads, uh, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest. You know where we are. Even where Satan's seat is. He even know where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, Antipas died for the Most High, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. See that? We have to learn that some of us are going to be martyrs, and some of us are not going to be martyrs. Some of our family members died this way. Many people ask, why can't the Most High keep his people from suffering? That's what a lot of people say. Just like they told Hamashiach Yahushai, if you are the if you are the Christ, if you are the Hamashiach, take yourself down from the cross. It's just a part of the sufferings we got to go through. Most of the time, we suffer for our own stupidity, a lot of us. Sometimes we can miss the mark on striving for the Most High by just being stupid. <laughs> and not follow his ways. It's normally our own fault by missing the mark. Most of the time. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall talk, ye shall take it patiently. But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye shall take it patiently. This is acceptable 
with the Most High. So when it says, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your fault? I was talking about when you do something stupidly, you praying to the Most High for help and you don't get the answer. You sitting there hoping the Most High will redeem you from your stupidness. That's why he says, but if when you do well and suffer for it, what is doing well? Keeping his commandments. This is talking about the believers, this part. When you do well, you take it patiently. And patiently isn't like sitting in traffic, waiting to get to work. You're sitting in traffic two hours, knowing your boss know that you're in traffic. That's that's a form of just laziness. You know you're getting paid. But the patient patience that he's talking about is enduring through pain. You know, it's something that you want. You want salvation. So you have to endure it. Most of y'all, most of most of the people uh listening don't want to go to work. So, so I mean, you get paid to the chair, it's different. But when you want, if say like if it was your business and you love your job, you're gonna be that person sitting in traffic blowing your horn. Move out the way. I gotta get to work. You know, it's a different, it's a different type of patience. Let's go to first Peter chapter three. And let's read verse 12. For the eyes of the Most High are over the righteous. You know, his, his eyes are 10,000 times brighter than the sun. That's what it says in the Apocrypha. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Most High is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? See that? But And if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. That's what we're going through now. Don't be troubled. But sanctify the most high in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I do that all the time. Our people should do that all the time when they talk to people. Put fear in them. Get angry. I, I got angry at a brother when he asked me for some money. It wasn't the fact that he asked me for money. It was the fact that I said, man, do you know who the Savior is? Do you know who's coming to redeem us? And then when I said, do you know who he's coming for? And the brother couldn't remember. I got angry. I walked off. I came back because I was going to the post office, but I walked off to go in the post. I was like, man, you don't know who he's coming. I said, I know you've been to church your whole life. He's an old guy. I said, I know you've been to church Sunday school. I said, I know you know who he's coming for. And he couldn't remember. He was dumbfounded. I walked in the post office, came back out. He said, brother, well, who who did he come for? I said, he's coming for the 12 tribes of Israel. He says, that's right. I, and I gave him the law, statutes, and commandments. I told him what he was supposed to do. I marched to my car, got in the car. Before I could get in the car, this brother ran, and he looked he looked like he was old and crippled. He ran to my car with his face mask on his chin, knocking on my window. He was like, what was the name of the people he's coming for again? I said, us, the 12 tribes of Israel. The blessing is he wanted to know. He ran to find out. That was the blessing. So we have to do it with fear. Show love with fear. Okay, not curse them. But just, you know, you got to show it in your spirit. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. See? Homosexuality, you see two men and two women together. Man, that vexes you. That vexes me. I can't even watch... Um, the news when it's a, a homo, homosexual talking. I got to turn, man. I guess. Like, ah, man, I'm tired of this. That's vexing yourself with the unlawful deeds of this of this world. The most I know of how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Most High is about to do something. It says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise go government. What government? The Most High's government. Presumptuous are they, 
self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. What dignities? The Most High's people, the Most High's prophets, the Most High's servants. If you put them in the scriptures, don't talk evil of none of these people in the scriptures. None of them. If you believe the scriptures, why would you speak evil of the scriptures in any form? There's always an antagonist, and there's always the opposite of an antagonist in the scriptures. You can't be mad at them. All you could do is just, it was written for our learning. First John chapter 5. Let's go to First John chapter 5, and let's read verse 16. First John chapter 5, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Give, that's your time to give him an answer. Tell him why we have salvation. Tell him why what life is. There is a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. See, some of us, like Daniel, escape death, but there are sin to death. You, you look at the Maccabees, right? Was that a sin unto death? No, they didn't sin. They sinned not. But there were some brothers who were. There were some brothers who were eating the swine. What was the name of the, um, there was a brother that came down to talk to them. Let me go there real quick. It's in 2 Maccabees chapter 6. Let's go to 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 1. And it reads, this is an apocrypha. Not long after this, the king sent an old man of Athens. This, this was a Grecian or a Hellenic Israelite to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and not to live after the laws of the Mosai. That's a sin unto death. See that? And to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter, Olympias, and that in Garizim, of Jupiter, defender of strangers, as they did desire that dwellers in the place. The coming in of this mischief was sore and grievous to the people. That's a sin unto death. That man should die for his sin, trying to bewitch the people. For the temple was filled with riot and reveling by the Gentiles who dallied with harlots and had to do with women within the circuit of the holy places, taking them into the holy temples and having sex with them. And besides that, brought in things that were not lawful. That is a sin to death. The altar also was filled with profane things which the law forbiddeth, like pork, you know, uh, things that shouldn't be cooked on the altar of the Most High. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days or ancient feasts or to profess himself at all to be a Jew. That is a sin to death, not keeping the commandments. That's what it, that's what it means there is some that is a sin to death. First John chapter 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. See that? The sin that's not unto death is the righteousness of those who stand up for the Most High and become a martyr, get, get put to death because of their love for the Most High, like the seven brothers, Judas Maccabees and his brothers. That is a sin, not unto death. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. When you come into the truth and you commit these sins, the most high could take you out for being unjust. And that's what happened to Ananias and his wife. Look at Acts chapter 5. Let's read Acts 5 and verse 1. It says, but, uh, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. She knew about it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? So there was probably an agreement between Ananias and his wife, 
selling his property and saying that he was going to give the church 50%. And he didn't. Gave him less than 50%. And, he, you know, that was already a promise. Verse 4. Wallace, it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto the Most High. See, he lied. So he said something about this. He's going, hey, you know, some brothers boast, man, I'm going to sell my property and give half to the church, and I'm going to keep the other half. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghosts. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Was he in the truth? Yeah. He was a believer. He was on his way to the temple. But he lied. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. She didn't even know her husband died. And Peter, they didn't have telephones back then. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. <clears throat> then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Most High? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the spirit. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Most high spirit ain't came on the earth like this yet. You still got mercy, but when it do come on the earth like this, you better be ready to give an answer for everything you do and not be mischievous with your words. If you say something, you better do it. So he wasn't playing. That's a sin to death. And then you have brothers who die heroically, and it's not a sin to death. Galatians chapter 6. Let's go back to Galatians. Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. But be not deceived. The Most High is not mocked. Can't mock the Most High when you're in the truth. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. See that? You got to be careful on your words. If we take a stand for the Most High, somewhere down the line, we are going to have to prove our stand. A lot of brothers don't understand that. We eventually going to have to prove our stand if we never did it before. All right. There's a lot of brothers who are on YouTube who just do classes, but ain't never been out on the streets. And don't and don't know how um, it feels to be out on the streets and people are persecuting you on the streets. You know, brothers are going to have to take a stand eventually. They're going to have to do it. When we look at certain people in the Bible, some were born for more sufferings than others. When we see stories like Job, he was born to suffer. He was born to suffer. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And let's read verse. Uh, let's read verse 8. Job 1 and 8. And it reads And the most I said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth the most high in the show of evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth the most high fear? Does Job fear the most high for not? Has not thou made an hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. And the substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he had. Basically, move his hedge. Move that hedge out the way. And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Most High said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Most High. 
And there was a day when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabines fell upon them, the Africans came, and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. See that? So Satan was able to affect Job and cause him to suffer. I, he was born for it. That's what Job was born for. It said that he was a righteous man, that he was a perfect and upright man. So he was born for that. He was born to endure the sufferings. All right, Job suffered. So, so do we have to suffer. Let's go to, uh, you know, it's just funny. When you, when you look through the scriptures and you think about all the brothers, even the sisters who had to suffer, there's a lot of martyrs in the Bible. Samson was a martyr, you know. Um, Stephen was a martyr. Let's go to Acts 22. The Maccabees were martyrs. Some brothers were born just for that. Acts chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 3. Acts 22, verse 3. And it reads, I am verily a man. Oh, and also Paul. It says, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet bought up, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards the Most High, as ye all are this day. He's talking to the clergy of the Israelites. And I persecuted this way unto death, and I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for it to be punished. Paul was killing people. He was killing Israelites. Paul was. Look at um, 2 Corinthians. By him killing people, he, he had also had to be persecuted that way. He had to go through the tribulations. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll come back to Stephen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And let's read verse 7. It reads, um, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellent excellency of the power may be of the Most High and not of us. We are troubled on every side. Yet not distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. See that? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Most High Yahweh Shai, that the life also of Yahweh Shai might be made manifest in our bodies. For we which live are always delivered unto death. For Yahweh Shai's sake that the life also of Yahweh Shai might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. See? So we have to be ready for that persecution. That's all Paul is saying. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It can naturally happen too. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse um, 25. And it reads, Three times I was beaten with rods. I'll start 25. Let's, let's jump up to 22. There's a lot of meat. It says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Hamashiach? I speak as a fool. I am more. So he's saying, even though these brothers are in the truth, they're not really in the truth. They really don't go out their way to teach the Gospels. They really don't go out their way to push this word out on our people. They really don't care. They're really not for Mashiach Yahweh Shai. So he says, I'm more than them. He's kind of boasting. He says, man, I'm doing more than what they could ever do. 
My life is on the line. He said, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. He went to prison more frequent. He got more stripes than them. In deaths often, he's always in, in the perils of death. Of the Jews, five times I received, I, 40 stripes, save one. He got whipped. Three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And he's still pushing the truth. In journeying often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. Remember the Good Samaritan? Well, remember the brother that was on the side of the road? He had been in perils. Good Samaritan rescued him. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Uh, let's read verse 27. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and that he goes on and on and on. All because he's following the Most High. All because he won't stop teaching the word of the Most High. Let's read verse 28. Besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the church. On top of that, he's still writing letters to the churches. Still writing letters to the churches. Still participating in events. Who is weak, and I am not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not. Remember what Paul said. He said, when we are weak, we are strong. You have to remember that too. When we are weak, we are very strong. Uh, when you look at uh, Daniel, he got thrown into the lion's den. He was weak, but he was strong in spirit. The Maccabees, they were weak, but that's when you're, you're strongest when you're weak. You notice that? When you're your weakest on the bed, you're holding strong, you're firm. You're stronger than you are weak, then you are strong. Your spirit is stronger. For a lot of brothers and sisters who've been in the hospitals who are fighting certain things, that's when you were your strongest when you were on that bed. Your faith was challenged, and you, and, and you had to believe in the Most High, the Heavenly Father, and the Son just to get through those perils. Okay, When you lose things on this earth, when you just have clothes that are in a box, and that's all you have, you're stronger when all you have is that. Versus property and all that stuff. You're stronger. You have to get through. You have to, you have to wiggle yourself through the next day. You're stronger. All those brothers and sisters who are homeless, a lot of them brothers are strong being out there, being homeless. All right? Some people were forced to be homeless. Not everybody decided or they wanted to be homeless. Some people, were, they had no other choice. Um, it's just amazing to me how the most high is. Let's go to Acts chapter 22 and let's read verse 19. Never underestimate the most high. Never under underestimate him. Acts 22 verse 19. And I said, O oh my power, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on you. This is Paul saying, know this. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Verse 21, and he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lift up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. See that? So it's just interesting when you see this. We had martyrs in our family history. A lot of our people were martyrs. Look at James um, being put to death by Herod. 
Look at Acts chapter 12. So we saw Stephen. Let's see uh, James getting put to death. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Look at that. So James was also a martyr. He died by keeping the Most High's word. So he was a martyr. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, Herod proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. Peter wasn't made to be a martyr. Right? Some brothers just can't take it. Some brothers ain't made to be martyrs. Some brothers are just made to suffer, like Job. Job was made to suffer, not be a martyr. There's levels of this. Um, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter, y'all should know, that should say after the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, to bring him the seven days after, right? To bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto the Most High for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers, meaning the, the guards, before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Most High came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smite Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise ye quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on the sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. So this angel got Peter out of jail. So he was made to show these heroic events so the people will believe, you know. You look at the Maccabees, um, a lot of them were martyrs. I don't know if uh, any of you brothers or sisters have a Septuagint Bible, but I have a Septuagint here, and in the Septuagint, there is a fourth Maccabees. There's a fourth Maccabees. And in the fourth Maccabees, it, one of the chapters talks about reasoning. There's good reasoning for everything you do. You have to have good reasoning to guide your emotions, your passions, your pain. You have to have reasonings or you won't be able to deal with it. You see, some people break down when they have cancer or something like that. They just break down and can't cope and they lose, lose everything. You know, when you look at this, it's going to, um, if you don't have a Septuagint, I'll read it. But I advise that you get a Septuagint Bible. All right, don't go out your way. You already have a King James 1611, but, you know, this is for other readings. It's the same thing as a 1611 King James Bible with the Apocrypha in it. It just has an extra Mac Maccabees in it. All right. Um, uh, and generally speaking, this was written, this was written and uh, given to the brothers and sisters who were in Egypt that lost their language. They couldn't speak Hebrew anymore. Uh, during the times of the Greeks. So this book has always been here, the Septuagint. Verse 28, this is uh, 4th Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 28. I'm just going to read it. It says, A pleasure and pain are, therefore, two gross of the body and the soul. So there are many offshoots of these passions. What passions? Pleasure and pain. And reasoning, the universal husbandman, purging and pruning these severely, and binding round and watering and transplanting in every way improves the materials of the morals and affections. Reasonings help guide you. They help guide you through your way. When you can't think straight, it's reasoning. It's the understanding of the Most High that allows you to sit back and think. When you talk to brothers in the truth, uh, when you're undecided about something and you call brothers who are a little bit more understanding of your situation, that's a form of reasoning. You're getting understandings. But there's another reasoning when you're going through something by yourself. 
It says, for reasoning is the leader of the virtues, but it is the sole ruler of the passions. Observe then first through the very things which stand in the way of temperance, that reasoning is absolute ruler of the passions. If you could, if you could tap into your reasoning of things, you could overcome all your passions, all your emotions through reason. Let's go to um, same chapter. I'm gonna jump. Actually, same book. I'm gonna jump over to the second chapter and I'm gonna drop down to verse ten. But I just want to show you how the Maccabees, how they just they were able to conquer all their passions before they got killed. It says, "For the law conquers even." affection to our parents, not surrendering virtue on their account, and it prevails over marriage love, condemning it with when transgressing law. It lords it over the love of parents towards their children, for they punish them for vice, and it domineers over the intimacy of friends, reproving them. Hold on. Reproving them when wicked, and think it not a strange assertion that reasoning can in behalf of the law conquer even enmity. It allows not to cut down the cultivated herbage of an enemy, but preserveth it from the destroyers and collecteth their fallen ruins. That's patience, man. That's a form of patience. Reasoning. You reason through things. A lot of people can't reason, man. They're ready to do it right then and there. They're ready to go headlong to do evil instead of rationalize, reason about it. So all of this is part of the sufferings and reaping what you sow. Let's go to Psalms um, 34. Psalms 34. Psalms 34 and 19. Psalms 34 and 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. See that? But the most high deliver of him out of them all. So there's many different afflictions. Some suffer for the faith and heroic behavior and some for other things. Some, some escape the sword and some slain by the sword through faith. Some people are permitted to suffer death, like I said. Let's look at Hebrews 11. Here's a good example. Good example of faith and persecution and reasoning. A lot of people can't take it. I mean, you can't be a martyr and be like, you know what? Lord, I want to be a martyr. And then one day you go for a swim and your legs freeze up while you're swimming out in the water. You'd be like, oh, Lord, please save me. Don't let me die this one time. Let me get back to, to, to my life. I promise you I'll never do this again. And you told the Most High you wanted to be a martyr. Don't promise something to the Most High or say something to the Most High, what you want to do, and you ain't meant for that. You can't handle it. A lot of people can't handle it. But there are some, some brothers and some sisters who are made for that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. Here's an example. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Escaped the edge of the sword. Some brothers escaped the edge of the sword. David escaped the edge of the sword. Saul was after him. He escaped it. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That's in the book of Elijah. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better residency. Some were tortured. Some became martyrs. Some were not martyrs. Some were martyrs. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Remember John the Baptist? He was in prison, 
but then he got beheaded. They were stoned. They were sown asunder, were tempted. Oh, how come they had to go through this? How come they couldn't escape that? Because they were made for it. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That was us in the wilderness when we were going into Africa. We were wandering through the deserts. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. The Most High having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. What was the promise? Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai is the promise. He came to save his people. That's the promise. He, come, he came to raise the dead and the living at the same time. The dead that sleep in Hamashiach and the living at the same time. He is the promise. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 and 9, but we see Yahweh Shai, who was made a little lower than the angels. All right, a lot of people don't believe that he was the son of the Most High, that he was the prophet. For the sufferings of what? Of death. He had to suffer death too. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of the Most High, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. See, he went through sufferings. We got to go through sufferings. He didn't do it for us. He did most of it for us, but we have to prove ourselves to the Most High too. We have to participate in the sufferings. How many of you ever heard of the Huguenots of France? They were a group of Protestants. They were killed by the Catholics. A lot of them died challenging the Most High, the Huguenots. There was some Jake in there, some of those Huguenots. They became martyrs saying, if God be for us, who can be against us? That was the Huguenots. That's what they said. A lot of people can't do that. The Huguenots. You can look those up. Part of history. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. They all were martyrs. Every last one of them. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Most High thy power loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, that word chasteneth doesn't mean punishment. A lot of people read that and be like, who the Most High love, he punishes. It doesn't mean punishment. You look that word up, it means to discipline. It means child training, to train. The Most High does not have undisciplined children. To train a child, you have to discipline them. You love them. They do something wrong, you whip their butts. All right? That's what we used to get whippings. We thought that our parents hated us because they whipped us, but they loved us even more because they wanted us to be disciplined and to get right in line, to get in line. So it's not punishing. It's a form of correction. All right. Those who those who get punished <clears throat> and, and don't know the most high, they're Satan's. That's why you keep reading. It says, if you endure chastening, chast chastening the most I deal with you as with sons. So you're a son and daughter of the most High, if you endure it. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, child training, discipline, where all are partakers, then are ye bastards and are not sons. You ever see a bad child? Don't follow no instructions. The mama don't even want him. She's embarrassed. You know what I mean? She, he don't follow no rules. The daddy's embarrassed. It's the way they raised him. Bastards. There was a man named, uh, was a soldier. His name was William the Conqueror. I don't know if a lot of y'all know 
who that is. He was a bad Mamma Jamma, William the Conqueror. He was signed his name William the Bastard. He signed his name William the Bastard because his father disowned him, Duke of Norman. He abandoned him as a child. So the way he got back, he would sign his name William the Bastard. He was hurt. You know? Our children have to be a part of the sufferings too. They have to prove themselves to us. It's not that you know, when the Most High chast chastises us, it, it's not that we did something wrong, but that he's just trying to prove prove us or prove you to be his child. That's all. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and 10. Hebrews 12 and 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. See, we're just trying to be partakers. We're trying to get a part of that heritage. If you're good to your parents, just think about it. If you treat your father and your mother right, you do everything they tell you to do, and you have other brothers and sisters who do not, when they die, what do you think the parents are going to do? They're going to leave you something. They're going to leave you something because they trust you on taking care of it. Where the other children are not that way. They see them, they give them, a thousand dollars and they squander it within two hours doing whatever they want, disappear. You know, most kids they give money, they just you don't hear from them anymore. No they just disappear for about six months. Then they come back with their hands out again. Why would you leave something for children like that? That's how the most high is. That's how it is. You know. Patience, productiveness is what the most high wants. He wants us to grow up and get out of that baby stage. He wants us to be men and women of conviction and spirit and courage. That's what he wants. Look at the great poets of the world. The great poets of the world are not in pulpits and churches. They're not in the Christian churches. Right? Most of them are, are on beds of pain. You look at uh, some of the poets out there, Alex Baldwin and Alice Walker and Maya Angelou, they all experienced pain, every last one of them. That's how they was able to write so good. Hamlet and, and uh, Shakespeare, they were all in pain. Look at David, King David and Solomon. Look at Sarah. You know, it's sorrowful when you read it. It's like you can see their spirits. Let's read Hebrews 12 and 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Most High, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So despise not the chastening of the Most High. Some guys say it's just my luck that this happened to me. You know, they don't believe in the Most High. The Most High don't deal with luck. If you're, if you're not a son of the Most High, then you haven't had no hard luck. A lot of people are ERs. You ever watch Disney's Wendy the Pooh? There's a donkey, is ER. Woe is me. Woe is me. A lot of people are just crybabies. The Most High wants your life to be a challenge to you. He wants to see you succeed. He don't want you to be a pious saint, someone who's passive about suffering. I take my cross and my pain. Yeah, you know, a lot of Christians do that. I got my cross on. I'm going to get through it. The rebellion of most of those type of people are inside of them. Chastening is just for a brief moment anyway. A lot of us endure a lot of chastening throughout our lives. I crack up over people who um, you ask them, do you believe in the Bible? And they'd be like, yeah. They're like, okay, what's your favorite verse? Most people recite the shortest verses in the Bible. They'll say, Jesus wept is my favorite verse. Or I'm praying without ceasing. That's what a lot of, a lot of people from Christian churches say. I, I pray without ceasing. Someone will be like, he must increase, I must decrease. They say that, you know, when pastors try to pass it to their deacons. But I used to deal with a lot of pastors 
back in those days just to see how they think. But my favorite was this one brother. Um, when I asked him what his favorite verse was, he said his favorite verse was, well, it came to pass. <laughs> and I used to ask him, why do you like that verse? And he said, when it came to pass, it meant that the suffering ended. I ain't got to go through it no more. It came to pass. And so, I mean, that's part of the thing. Uh, so like I said, sufferings, the chastening, a lot of times is for a short moment. Sometimes it could be years. You look at um, Jacob. Jacob had to go through it for seven years plus another seven just to win over Leah and then Rebecca. So he went through chastening for 14 years, but it was all in the benefit of the Most High where the 12 tribes of Israel were pro uh, produced on the earth. So don't say you're a martyr and you're going through, you know, and you can't bear it. You know, you got to be able to bear these things. Um, kind of like uh, someone says, you know what, I got cancer. And then you talk to somebody else and they be like, you know what? Well, I'm just going to pray that cancer. I'm just going to pray that you that the most high just take you out because you got that cancer. Nobody want to hear that. I pray for myself if that's the case. You know what I mean? If I had something like that. It's between you and the most high when it comes to that and somebody talking crazy like that. So you have to know your limits. Your reasoning has to kick in. You have to know what the most high wants. You have to know of your service. What is your service on this earth? You have, to, you have to be able to maneuver through this earth, pushing the Most High's word. It says, if you endure chastening, the Most High dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So take an inventory of your life when trouble comes and meditate on all your ways with the Most High's righteous paths. And those ways, uh, compare it and repent for the things that you may have done. My cousin used to tell me, if you ever get a whipping by Popo, that was my grandfather, we called him Popo. He would cut trees down for a living, so his hands was super hard. This dude was cut up, and he didn't play. Last person you wanted to get a whipping by was him. He had a heavy hand. But my cousin mastered the whippings. <laughs> and he said, if you, ever want to get, if you ever get a whipping by him, let him hit you first at a far. He said, take the first lick at a far. Then after the first lick, he said, start moving in. Start stepping closer to him because the closer you get, the less the whip is going to hurt. And I remember one time I got the whipping from him, and I remember what my cousin said. And that first hit, I was at a far, and it hurt like hell. And just to move forward, I was scared to move forward, but I did what my cousin said up until I got to his hand, and it was he was right. The less it hurt when I got closer to him. <laughs> but, you know, the Most High is that way, too. The Most High wants us to get closer to him. You know, when we get chastened, the farther away, it's going to hurt more. And that's what a lot of people can't endure. They can't endure just that one hit. But we are supposed to get closer to him, close enough to see his hand hitting us. All right, where it's, where it's not as hard. And the scriptures talk about that. Look at uh, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 1. It reads, I am the true vine. Who's that? The house And my father is the husbandman. He is the one that's going to hold the vine, that switch. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, that's us, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Christ, Hamashiach, is that whipping stick. And the father, the husbandman, is the one that's whipping the branch or us. We got to get closer because all he's doing is discipline us. The most High is ever so close to the vine as when he is trimming. Basically, he's like a pruner. We want to get as close as possible to that hand trimming. Look at um, Romans chapter 12. Verse 
Romans chapter 12, and let's read verse 5. So we being many are one body in Hamashiach, and every one members one of another. So we need courage and conviction in the lives of Israelites and recognize there are no accidents when we serve in the Most High. Most people say, why did I, why did the Most High let this happen to me? But, but you got to understand, there is a fight for victory for the Most High. Job found that out. That's why he endured. He endured to the end. That's what we have to do the same thing. Israel, there I will plant them, and they shall dwell in their own land. 